Okay. Well, I'm really looking forward to the the question and answer session at at the end of this. So I'm gonna I might go a little bit uh, fast on some of the slides, but you I'll I'll get you the main point for every every one of them. So uh, you know, full conflict of interest uh, on this website in the lower right hand corner. A little spinning molecule there is transfer RNA, which I've been working on for five decades, uh, um, among other things. Worked on other things. So here's an example of something I've been working uh, on called uh, nanopore sequencing. And this is uh, uh, astronaut Kate Rubens, who is, who's also a, a biologist scientist. And uh, I got to talk to her while she was on the International Space Station. And, and, and what you can see right in the lower right-hand corner here is one of these nanopore sequencers, which are kind of you know, the size of a small uh, handheld phone. Um, and uh, and they, they had four of them on the International Space Station, and they all performed very well. Um, and that was one of our goals in, in, in my NASA project was to reduce the size of the sequencing device to something that would end, end the power consumption. Uh, I have another project uh, where we're uh, trying to make reduce the size of probes. So we reduce the size of sequencing devices from something the size of a refrigerator. Uh, now we're trying to do the same thing for space probes, for example, setting up GPS satellites around the moon, just like we have GPS satellites around the Earth right now. And some of this is synthetic biology um, at this company, Copernicus. Uh, uh, aimed at get, getting to really long distances with very small packages. We are interested in, these are the two uh, uh, fastest growing organisms. E. coli used to be the, the fastest growing organism, but we, we've developed this one, uh, which is, uh, as you can see, it's considerably faster in this time lapse. And we're very interested in biomass doubling uh, and efficiency in general. We think we can maybe get 100 or 200 times the, the uh, doubling time and efficiency of, of, of the fastest crops like corn. Um, we also think that this can, if this device can fit in your kitchen, then we could eliminate supply chains. They could make not only foods, but materials and maybe even uh, other things. So, um, so, so that, that last slide showing exponential growth of bacteria is similar to the exponential improvement in the technologies. So we've we've reduced the my team and, and other teams that I work with have reduced the cost of reading and writing DNA by about 20 million fold. And the quality has improved uh, considerably uh, during that period of time as well. And I would think that most of it, or at least the part we're involved in, involves multiplexing, where you can mix together samples that are tagged uh, so that you can synthesize or read uh, many at once. And here's a student of mine, Dennis Grisham, who helped start uh, a company uh, uh, that does whole genome sequencing for uh, $249. It's hard to keep up, isn't it? Um, so this is, this is about microscopes. The sequencing, there are two kinds of sequencing. There's the nanopore that I showed is very small, and then the microscopy. Almost all of the sequencing is done by microscopy. Uh, the fluorescent sequencing is microscopy. And here's some of our early prototypes, which was literally a Nikon microscope. Um, uh, here's a more uh, recent version of it um, called the Zinium. And this is uh, can do DNA, RNA, and protein microscopy where every pixel, or in three dimensions, is called a voxel. Every voxel um, uh, can, can identify which DNA, RNA, protein it is based on its sequence uh, in situ. So you get all the morphology and the an anatomy all the way down to as little as 15 nanometer resolution. That's about the size of a nucleosome, uh, if you think about nucleosomes. And uh, this is um, uh, Professor Ting Wu, who happens to also be my wife, uh, completely independent laboratory, works on on uh, the folding of DNA. So this is a loop of chromatin in a chromosome. And each of these little balls is on the order of a couple of nucleosomes. This is the basic unit of DNA protein interaction. And this is showing that, that, that you can display a large piece of chromosome 19. And in fact, you can do the whole, all the chromosomes now um, with this method. 
You can also do it for RNA. So this is a single cell. Each dot is a single RNA molecule, four colors for the four bases. And then you can have the computer um, read out the barcode. Each, each dot now is a line of uh, information that tells you what RNA it is. And this is actually done with cells from my body. Mo the, both of those slides, both the, the DNA and the RNA are done with um, um, cells from my body, either stem cells or fibroblasts. And then finally, proteins. So DNA, RNA, protein. You can do these with uh, antibodies that are labeled with DNA. Uh, you probably recognize this Y-shaped molecule. They're also tiny uh, antibody-like molecules. And these allow us to do super resolution, just like the, the DNA slide that I showed. Um, and here you can see synapses, for example, which in regular microscopy, you, there's all blurry, but with the super resolution, um, you can actually see up to four proteins pointing the direction from uh, presynaptic to postsynaptic. This is the direction that the neural signals go. And they also tell the difference between excitatory and inhibitory um, function in the neurons. And this is Yu Wang. He was a graduate student in, in, shared in my lab in Peng Yen's. We also store, uh, so, so all those methods produce a lot of data and we coinci coincidentally or ironically uh, store data in, in DNA form. And uh, probably our most successful DNA storage is in, in mice where we can store uh, <clears throat> information about their development from egg all the way up to adult. Every, every tissue in their body uh, stores this information. Uh, and we all can store physiological information. So for example, um, in the upper right uh, is data on, on the concentration of a, 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 an oxygen-related uh, compound uh, where you can encode the time and the concentration of this, of this uh, chemical. So uh, we estimate that we're storing on the order of a almost uh, well, about two, uh, two tenths of a terabyte, meaning 200 gigabytes of information in a mouse in just a nanogram of material of the mouse body. And we think we can store one exabyte of information. So you, you probably have some idea of what, what size a disk drive is for uh, terabytes, but exabytes are uh, a million times that. And somehow we fit that inside of the mouse's body without bothering it. Uh, this, is, this is the way we did it using a modified version of CRISPR. Doesn't matter that much uh, uh, for, this, for this particular discussion. And we think that uh, since we can record physiological information like oxygen um, related compounds, in principle, uh, all the senses, uh, chemo sense, you know, taste, touch, vision, hearing, all of those are physiological. They evolve changes of chemicals in the respective sensory organs. Uh, and so we think we could do uh, record all of these uh, kind of like a video camera would, but instead of storing it onto magnetic or electronic media, we store it in, in DNA form directly. It goes directly basically from photons to cells to DNA. And some of these are very interesting uh, animals. So for example, the, the swift will stay uh, flying for 10 months. Um, without landing on the ground, a dragonfly will go 7,000 kilometers, <clears throat> a good fraction of, of the way around the earth uh, in its migration uh, and so forth. And some of these are really tiny, like this, this, is, this, um, this fly is a fraction of a millimeter. And this protist, which has a retina, uh, is, on, is only a 10, 30 microns. Okay, so another thing we can do is we can engineer genomes. We started doing this in 2009, where we published well, our, my student, Ming, uh, <clears throat> Harris Wang, uh, would, could, could create 5 billion genomes per day uh, that were altered at up to 10 different lo loci. Um, fast forward to this year, and we have, we've changed uh, not 10 loci per genome, but um, 18,000, and I'll show you what you can do with that when you, when you can change that many. 
you can you can make uh, new amino acids and you can make them resistant to all viruses. You'll see that in a moment. Our first uh, effort was to change one. This is the genetic code. So you have triplet codons and you have um, uh, the numbers here, are the number of times that triplet codon, the six, one out of 64 is used in real proteins, in the, the all the proteins of the genome. So the first one we picked was the, the, the easiest one. It was only 321. I mean, we changed that one. So one out of 64. And then Jason Chen's lab changed two more uh, for a total of three. And now we're in the process of changing six more uh, uh, out of 64. So, so what's the maximum you can change the genome, right? You would think you can change everything, but it's not so easy. So let's start with the easy thing, which is synonymous codons. Like going back to this, there are six leucine codons. There are six serine codons and there are six arginine codons. And most of the others are four or two or even one. Tryptophan and methionine here are one codon each out of 64. So, so, so let's stay synonymous. So within the six leucines, uh, what can we do? And, um, and the answer is we can change about 35% of the, of the base pairs uh, in the genome um, by doing that. Which means, uh, yeah. So, 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 how many can we change if we if we're not requiring synonymous change? In other words, if we actually change the amino acids, if we change everything as radically as possible. Now, there's some amino acids that are just required for the function of the protein. We're not going to change those, but all the other ones. So, for example, here's we're changing 28 amino acids in a row in the um, AAV capsid. Now, this is the major viral capsid that used for gene therapy. So this is very well studied. We decided we wanted to change it to, to just so it would work better in the immune system of the patient and also so that it could go to particular tissues specifically. And when we started, we were having trouble making even four changes out of 28. Uh, just four out of 28 would break that, that protein and would break almost any protein. Um, but then we started using machine learning AI logistic regression method, um, and then we can make 26, 27, even 28 out of 28, we can make lots of, find lots of solutions where we would change all 28 amino acids. So this was a real breakthrough that we're using in a bunch of different ways. Eric and Pierce um, um, were uh, graduate students and postdocs that worked with me. Um, and, and, and we use that same sort of thing, the machine learning plus mega libraries, meaning millions of, uh, the machine learning suggests millions of solutions. Maybe only a few of them are really good. We take the best solutions by that combination of machine learning and mega libraries. And then we started these six companies to do that for different categories of proteins and cells and RNAs. I already showed you this one. Um, so we, we are, doing organ transplants. Uh, so we're doing them in, in primates. Humans are primates, but these are non-human primates initially. And we're not just in, there's a crisis in there, not enough organ donors. But in addition, some of the organs will, will fail multiple times. So, so we want to make these organs enhanced relative to, to normal organs. And it's very hard to make enhancements to human organs, which is the usual uh, source. So we're engineering the germline of, of animals like pigs. And so I'll mention seven different enhancements, and this gives you some idea of the breadth of synthetic biology as to all the things you can do to organs. So the first two of these seven are cryopreservation and dehydration. And this is inspired by, by two animals. The salamander, this particular Siberian salamander, can make it through the fierce Siberian winters at as low as 50, minus 55 centigrade. Um, freeze a solid. Um, the, this midge, this fly, the, the larvae of a flying insect, can not only be frozen, it can also be desiccated, and, and it can take high radiation. So that's number one and two. Number three is uh, avoiding immune rejection. <clears throat> and for this, we had to make 69 edits to the germline of the pig. Here's one of the cute little piglets of which we have in abundance now. And once they're edited, you don't have to keep editing them every time you want to transplant an organ. 
they basically breed like pigs do, uh, and each each of the offspring inherits all of the edits that we made. And so these uh, all these edits help us uh, avoid immune rejection, and they allow us to also edit the the viruses that are in the genome of the pig. These are not external viruses, but internal viruses. And we got rid of all of those, all 59 of those viruses at once. And these are making, these have uh, survived um, over 700 days, uh, about two years in the, in, in the primates. And so that, me, that was the signal that we're ready to do it in, in humans. And we'll be doing that very soon. Luhan Yang was a graduate student and a postdoc in my lab. Um, and she helped start a company to do this. So that's three out of seven. Fourth out of seven is ionizing radiation. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great to you know, have a superpower being resistant to radiation? And so we've, uh, we, we should note here that from another lab uh, that as little as four mutations will uh, produce a 100,000-fold increase in radiation resistance from a starting point that was fairly re radiation resistant already. So these are highly radiation resistant, just four mutations. Wouldn't you like to be resistant to all viruses? Uh, you know, this, would, for, this could be flu, um, uh, common cold, coronavirus, HIV, polio, so forth. Um, we've done this now for one organism, an industrial microorganism uh, resistant to all viruses. And we did, and we did this by recoding, which I've already mentioned the genetic code. And you get these new amino acids, you get biocontainment, and you get this multivirus resistant. Um, and the way we make it multivirus resistant is we we change the code so that serine two serine codons out of sixty four are no longer required. So two serines out of six serines out of sixty four total codons. And they're no longer required, so that the cell is doesn't need them anymore. And then, then you bring back those two codons, but now is leucine. So we've essentially done a serine to leucine swap. And serine and leucine are uh, amino acids that are very different chemically, and so they don't substitute well. And so the viruses weren't in on the original game where we went to all this work to free up the serine codons and then swap the leucine. Um, and so they need those two codons in every single protein. Um, and they and leucine is a very is a very mixed up uh, signal that they get. So so that if every one of their proteins is broken in multiple ways because they're getting serine swap for leucine. And we're pretty sure this provides resistance to all viruses. You can see here dropping down to uh, undetectable levels. Uh, we're sure this is uh, all viruses, that were, not only all viruses that were known before we started study, but we went out and, and, and found many more viruses in the wild and, and showed that those viruses would infect the previous best strain, but not our new strain. Uh, so the final uh, enhancements for our organs uh, are six and seven are aging and cancer, respectively. Six for aging, seven for cancer. And there's about 10 pathways um, for these that are pretty well characterized, uh, things like making the ends of your chromosomes more stable, mitochondrial function, caloric restriction, and stem cells, and so on. And they're understood well enough that we can make gene therapies that will alter the, our natural tendency to age. Mice will naturally age two years, bowhead whales 200 years. They're both mammals, um, but their, their genome tells them when to die. And we want to delay that uh, considerably. And so um, we're, we, we focus on age-related diseases. Here's seven age-related diseases on the right. And we use either single genes or multiple genes in gene therapy. Like, um, and here's the death curve, essentially survival probability going dropping to zero um, for normal untreated mice on the left here, drop most of them dying by 28 um, months. And then here, two independent gene therapies, not combined, each of them showing a very significant, you know, 32 to 41% improvement in longevity. So normally we're not looking for longevity, we're just looking for reversal of age-related diseases. That's easier to get approval, but in this case, we, we let the animals 
go all the way and see how long they live. And that's very uh, encouraging. Now, some of you may, may know that gene therapies can be expensive. So for rare diseases, they can be over $3 million a dose, most expensive drugs in history. But I was excited uh, much more so by bringing down the price like we did for sequencing. And, we, and uh, all five of the top COVID vaccines are actually formulated like gene therapies. And one of them, which has a double-stranded DNA and an adenovirus capsid, is as little as $2 a dose. So it can be done, um, bringing it down from 3 million to two by focusing on common diseases. Uh, we have a map of, of all the RNAs that are made in every tissue, basically an idea. It's a kind of a fingerprint of what, of how each tissue, what makes each tissue behave differently, your kidney behaving differently from your brain. Um, and we have taken those cells and put them into mice uh, that are where the mice has a disease, a brain disease, which is uh, causes it to lose the myelin the, in the in, around its neurons. So the myelin wraps around the axon this, and um, it allows the signals to go very fast for certain neurons uh, in the in the uh, white matter. It's the white is the wrapping uh, in the brain and also going down your spinal column where it has to go a long distance and you want it to go as fast as possible. Anyway, there's this autoimmune disease that, that kills off the myelin, destroys the myelin, and then we can restore it with, with uh, cells that are resistant to the autoimmune disease. So we both fix the disease and we prevent further disease. So that we're doing this now with epigenetic reprogramming where you each, but using the RNA, we can tell, we can tell the cell that it becomes a different kind of cell. So it can either make the cell into a neuron or into a, the oligodendrocytes that wrap the neurons, or we can also make the components of the ovarian follicles that make the human eggs. And, uh, and we, and we, we, there are two main components. There is the, the <coughs> egg precursor and then the granulosis, which are support cells that help mature. And those support cells, those granulosis cells are now in, uh, uh, in vitro fertilization clinics to see if we can mature the eggs um, and help, therefore help the mothers that, that uh, are having infertility issues um, by, by helping the mature the, the eggs. And the final topic, which deserves more than one slide, but we can talk about it in the discussion if you want, is this idea of endangered species and restoring uh, environments, um, both for the sake of the plants and animals, but also for the sake of humanity, because we have the, the environments of greatest concern, I think, should be and are the, the Arctic. The Arctic is 19 million square kilometers. A huge fraction of it has uh, carbon buried a lot of carbon in the topsoil and a lot of that carbon is escaping as as the as it melts each summer it melts and refreezes uh, during the winter but but that 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 that, car, that melting is getting worse the, the it's warming up um twice as fast as the rest of the world and in the form of methane which is 80 times worse than carbon dioxide for the global warming um so there are keystone species that have proven uh, valuable in the past. Um, so uh, uh, hundreds of these keystone of these species have been rewilded, meaning re almost extinct, returned to their natural environment, um, or extinct in a particular location, or extinct in the wild, only found in the lab, or frozen away. And one of the one of the first and dramatic examples was restoring the wolf to Yellowstone National Park. United States after 70 years, after 70 years, um, the, the deer were uh, preventing the baby willows from growing up and the wolf would chase them away. Didn't really um, make fewer deer, but they, they, were, they stayed away from the willows long enough for the willows to get to full size. And then the beaver would turn those into beaver homes, uh, which would change the, the waterways and build up lakes which would encourage fish and, and uh, waterfowl, water birds. And so that shows how introduce, reintroducing one species can fix 
uh, ecosystem was basically broken and restore its performer glory. This is also true for elephants, but, uh, whether they're in Africa or whether they're in Siberia, they, they are very crucial to the environment. They're the only animal that will knock down, directly knock down trees, allowing the grass to return, which includes higher reflected light, more packing of the snow to allow the, the chilling to happen in the winter time, um, and, is, and grass has better uh, photosynthetic rate. And it makes, it fixes carbon better. And here's an illustration of my friend and uh, uh, colleague, Sergei Zimov, who runs Pleistocene Park. It's kind of like Jurassic Park in, in Siberia. And here he's lighting a little hole in the ice of, of a lake. So he's standing on the lake and you can see the methane um, jet uh, lighting on fire as it comes out, escapes. But it's not just the lakes. It's almost all the lakes in Siberia and the soil and the the oceans around it. So that we got this very serious problem. We know a lot about what what uh, what, it, what it takes to make an elephant cold resistant, and but but we're not limited to the elephant and mammoth genes. So we can read the mammoth DNA into the computer, even though it's very ancient and broken up. But we're not limited to that. We're, we're also working on ways to make this elephant resistant to viruses, like I mentioned earlier, and uh, making them so that they can either have long tusks or, or no tusks, depending on whether at risk for poachers. Uh, poachers will, won't usually touch the elephants if they don't have tusks. So that's a, the quick version, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about uh, now. Uh, we have.